Then we will start our discussions on the SRAM technology. This is the first type of the memory we are going to discuss in details. And this is an outline. First, we will talk about the SRAM's operation principle for the six transistor cell, 60 SRAM cell. And then we will talk about the SRAM stability uh, using the static and dynamic analysis, basically to evaluate the noise margin. And then we will talk about the layout for the six transistor SRAM cell. And then we will talk about some issues regarding the scaling and the variability. And also we will briefly touch upon the soft arrow in the SRAM cell that was uh, introduced by the radiation effect. And then the last topic will be the thin fat based SRAM design. All right, SRAM, short for static random access memory. And here let's look at how does those Keyword mean. So first, static means what? No periodic refresh needed. So this is respect to the DRAM we will talk about later. In the DRAM, you need the periodic refresh. As SRAM is static, that means as long as you have the power supply, then you don't need to refresh the data. So the data will be there forever as long as your power supply is there. And then the random access here means each bit of the memory array can be accessed. Accessed means read or write independently. So that means you can give, a, give an address, then you can locate any bit in the memory array and then go to that bit to do the read or the write operation of that individual bit. This is respect to the land flash we will talk about later. So the, in the land flash, it's not random access. If you want to erase the data, you have to erase the whole block. You cannot do individual bits. But for the SRAM or the DRAM, because it's run, random access memory, then you can operate on individual bits. And the last feature of the SRAM is volatile memory. This means if the power supply is removed, then you will lose your memory state. So you cannot store your memory data if the power supply is removed. And here is the history of the SRAM cache evolution. So in the 1980s, so the processor only will have the logic component, like your ALU. The caches are actually off chip at that time, and you only have one level of cache. But the trend is to have more levels of the cache because we want to have the balance in the memory hierarchy, as we discussed earlier. We have the trade off between the speed and the capacity. And also, the trend is to integrate the caches on the same chip of the processor. And then they, this is a typical hierarchy. You have three levels of cache on the same processor with the logic component. And then L1, L2, L3 are all made of SRAM cells. And here are the typical like, uh, capacity like L1 256 kilobytes, L2 1 megabytes, L3 8 megabytes. This is typically for you know, PC, for laptops. Of course, for the servers, then this will be larger. But this is typical for your PC. Okay, so let's look at the S1 cell made of six transistors. So it's called 6T SRAM cell. So this is uh, the common design used uh, in almost every product you have. So here, this is one cell for one bit information. And we have two inverters in the middle. Those are cross coupled. And then here we have N1 and N2 nodes. So this is called the storage node. The data will be stored in this N1 or N2 node. 
and then we will have this cascade transistor PG transistor to collect the storage node to the bit line. So in the S run, it's a symmetric design. So you will have bit line, bit line bar. So this is a, a complementary uh, bit line. And then the word line here is going to control the gate, as gate. So if you draw the transistor out, then you have the six transistor schematic on the right. And then we have the cross coupled uh, inverters in the middle, match in the middle. So here we have few definitions uh, of those transistors. So here PD is a pull down MOS transistor. And the PG has gate MOS transistor. And the PU the pull up PMOS transistor. So later we will use those acronyms for the discussions. So please get familiar with those PD, PG, and PU. And uh, here we have four MOS, two PMOS. All right, so let's look at the operation principle of the s cell. cell. Straightforward. So there are three modes. The first one is hold mode. So in the hold mode, then you don't do read and write, you just hold the data. So if you want to hold the data, then you need to apply power supply VDD. But the word line will be turned off. So you will have word line ground zero for the word line. If the word line is zero, then you know this MOS transistor will be off. So what is left is in the, the cross coupled inverters in the middle. So this is a latch. There's a positive feedback within those, within those two inverters. So the data pattern will only be like a zero and one or one and zero. So here, for example, in this example, N1 stores zero, N2 will store one. And typically we will use the data that is stored in N1 node that is attached to the bit line as the stored data. So we can interpret this as your data. And then the other one is always complementary. So this will be your data bar. You can only have those two kinds of pattern, zero, one, or one, zero. Because this is a cross coupled inverters. And then if you want to read out the data, you will need to first pre-charge bit and bit and bar to be VDD. So this needs to be VDD. And then you turn on the word line. So word line used to be zero for the read or for the hold. Now you need to turn on the word line. If you turn on the word line, then you see that here on the left. So this pass gate one, PG1, will be turned on because here the N1 node store zero. And then here you turn on this, that means this is VDD. And also the bit line is VDD. So you see this MOS transistor like a VGS and a VDS. So this is transistor is in the saturation mode actually. So you will have current flow this way. So if you have current flow this way, then the bit line will be discharged. So bit line will have the parasitic capacitance. So the discharge current will pull down the bit line voltage from VDD to VDD minus delta V. So the bit line will decay. But on the right hand side, then you see the voltage bias. This is one, this is one, and also this is one VDD. So the, on the right hand side, this PG2 will not uh, be turned on. So basically the three terminals will be equal potential, no current flow, so nothing will happen. So on the right, you will still have VDD. So now you see a difference between the bit line and bit line bar voltage. So the peripheral circuit, the sense amplifier, 
you, you need to have this attached to a sense amplifier. It's a differential comparator, basically. So this sense amplifier will detect the difference between those two. And now the left branch, the bitman, has lower voltage than, than the right branch, bitman bar. So then this will be interpreted as digital zero, and then this one will be interpreted as digital one. So basically, the smaller one will be amplified to ground, and the higher potential will be kept as VDD, the digital one. So this is a read operation. And then write operation, what do you need to do here, for example, if initially the N1 stores zero, and now you want to write the new data in, the new data is to store the N1 to be one, so you need to flip the data here. What you need to do is to prepare the new data from outside. That means from the bitman bitman bar. So that means the bitman needs to be one VDD here, and then bitman bar will be ground. So this is the new data you you will write in. Again, you have to turn on the VLAN. The VLAN needs to be turned on. Then the new data here, this one, will trigger the N1 to switch from zero to one. And this new data zero will trigger the N2 node flip from one to zero. So you will flip the data from the outside. And we will discuss more details later. So it's not as simple as you think here. You have new data one zero outside, then you just copy the data into the storage node. It's not as simple as that. We'll discuss that in more details in the later slide. Question? Mm -hmm. We will discuss that in more details shortly. Stay tuned. So this is a very high level overview of the operation Principle. Later we'll discuss the exact timing and the requirements of the buyers. How to initialize the S run? Oh, that's a very good question. So as long as you turn on the power supply, the S run will have a random pattern because there will be noise and there will be process variation. So if those S run is perfectly matched, that means left and right are symmetric, then the initial state will be determined on the random noise as you turn on that moment, you turn on the power supply. If they have some built in bias, let's say left is always leading towards the ground, then the initial state will be N1 will be ground. So as long as you turn on the S run, there will be a random pattern. And then, then you have to write in your data from the whatever controller you have from or from the processor, what kind of data you, you need. Okay, so then let's have a review. Uh, here, hold operation, as we discussed, those two pass gates will be off. And then let's look at so-called butterfly curve. So in the hold mode, in the hold mode, if those two transistors are off, in the middle you have this cross coupled latch. Then you know for the inverter, you will have this voltage transfer curve, VTC voltage transfer curve. So let's look at the inverter two first. So the inverter two's input is N1. Output is N2. So if you have this VN1 and VN2 plot, you have the blue curve here. As you increase the N1 node from 0 to VDD, then your N2 load initially at VDD will gradually flip to the ground. So you have this blue trajectory here. And then if you look at the inverter one, so here the input and output basically reversed. And then 
in this same plot, you can simply mirror the VTC of the blue curve to the red curve along the 45 degree here. You still have a 45 degree line. Then you simply flip the VTC curve. You have the red curve that is for the inverter Y because the input and output exchange the location. So this is like a butterfly. This is called the butterfly curve for the cross-coupled inverter, this match. And you have three intersections of this cross-coupled uh, match. So those are the stable points. So here you have two stable points here. This is the data pattern you store, either like V1, Vn1 is 1, Vn2 is 0, or Vn1 is 0, Vn2 is 1. So those are the two stable points. And in the middle, this is so-called the meta-stable point. So here, if everything is symmetric, then this will be half VDD and half VDD. So that means if the N1 is half VDD, N2 is half VDD, the circuit is kind of stable. However, this is not really stable because any noise will flip the circuit into one of those really stable points. So if you have any noise on metastable points, then you will flip. That means in practice, this metastable point does not exist. You always will have noise in the circuit. So let's look at why this butterfly curve can hold the data. Because there are some certain tolerance to the noise in the circuit if you are in the really stable point. For example, here, if your initially data is here, that means you store here, you say the, this is Vn1. That means Vn1 is 0. And then here, Vn2 is at VDD is 1. So this is your data pattern you store. Now, assuming that you have some noise to the circuit, this noise somehow makes the is an inject to the N2 load to bring down the N2 load voltage by a certain amount, like this one. So here, if you have noise, make the N2 load voltage decrease by this, then you can use this butterfly curve to basically trace the evolution of the circuit operation points. So here, if the N2 decreases by this delta V, for example, you have some delta V. So you are going to use N inverter 1 to look at what is the output of inverter 1, that is to look at what is N1 node. So you should use the, uh, let's say, the, oh, let, let's do this way. I think initially, I interpreted this incorrectly. So I think the initial law is, is to make the, N1 node increased by some delta V. So this is the step one. I jump to step, step two directly. So let's start with step one. If the N, N1 node increased by delta V, that means here N1 node increased by delta V. So you have to use inverter two to look at what is the output change. So inverter two use a blue curve. So you have to look, use the blue curve. So if the input is changed to here, from the blue curve, then your output from this blue curve will change to here. In, input increase to here from the blue curve, you will look at the output decrease by this delta V. And if the output decrease by delta V, this will be the input for the inverter one then you will use the red one to continue this loop. So if the V2 decreased by delta V like this, if you use the red one, that means here, if it decreased by here, you use follow the red one, you look at this. Now the V1 needs to be here. So V1 needs to change from here back to here. And then you keep this loop 
now you, you, it's time for the blue curve. So you look at this blue curve. If input is here, output should be here. So then this means it will go back to here. So after a few iterations, eventually you realize that, okay, this operation point will return to its original state, which is here. So basically this cross coupled match has this positive feedback. You can trace how the operation points change through those cross coupled VTC curves. But the point is that as long as the loss is within certain range, you can always restore the data to its original state. So the S1 has certain tolerance to the noise. But of course, if the noise is too large, if initially, for example, here, this one jumped to here somewhere, if the noise is so large, then it will flip to the other state. So there's a certain noise margin, and we will discuss that later. What is the noise margin? And then the read operation here. So we will analyze the read operation to answer one of your questions earlier. So what will happen to the N1 node? So let's look at the read operation. Huh? What's the question? What determines the slope? So the slope will be determined by like, the transistor's output characteristic, ID versus VD, whether the saturation is really saturated or not. If it's really saturated, then it will be a very sharp transition. But normally, the transistor, as we discussed earlier, due to the short channel effect, then the ID, VD is not like, uh, saturated. Then you will have the slope. So then let's look at the read operation. So here this will be a little bit tricky. It's not as simple as you may think. So here let's review the read condition. First, we need to pre-charge the bitman bitman bar, both be VDD. Both will be VDD. And then we turn on the word line. The word line will be turned on to VDD. So here, this, this example assume N1 stores 0, N2 stores 1. As we discussed, the PG1 will be turned on, and then there will be current flowing through the PG1. So this current eventually is to sink to the ground, which is here. So this current will flow through PG1 and PD1. And this current will discharge the bit line so the bitman here will have a decay of the voltage VDD minus delta V. So this is the read operation for the bitman. And bitman bar in this case will stay VDD. So here you see the timing. The bitman will decay by this delta V and bitman bar will stay. So this delta V is the sense margin. So let's look at what will happen here. So this rate current through PG1 and PD1 will have one effect on the N1 node. That means the N1 node voltage will increase a little bit. Why is that? So this PG1 and the PD1, you can think on the bottom right figure here. You can have some approximation. You can think the PG1 is like a resistor, and the PD1 is also like a resistor. So you have this current pass from the bit line, which is precharged to bit VDD, and then to the ground, discharge pass from VDD to ground. So you have two resistors. This is like a resistor divider, voltage divider. So the middle load voltage will be increased above ground. 
So that means this zero is not exactly zero. There will be some voltage increase to the N1 node. There will be some voltage increase to the N1 node. This is very important. But then the design consideration is the N1 node voltage increase should be minimal because you don't want to change the data. So after the read operation, you want N1 still stores zero. But if the voltage increase too much to the N1, this zero is no longer zero, then that's not good. So you have to make sure the increase of the N1 node voltage is minimal. So how do you ensure that? So again, you can use this circuit to look at the requirement. So this approximation to resistor, right? So if you want this middle load voltage to be small, to be as close as ground, what should you do for the two resistance here? Let's say for the PD1, PG1 resistance, which one should be larger? If you want the zero to be close to zero. So resistor divider, right? So PD1 should be small in terms of resistance. So this is resistor, but for transistor, then we have to translate that to the conductance or the current. Then that means PD1's conductance should be higher than the PG1. And for transistor, the conductance, you know, let's use the saturation current, VGS minus VT, something like this, right? This is to the first order. So the transistor's conductance, of course, those are technology parameters you cannot change. Those transistors will be the same as the same technology load. So what you can do is to play with the ratio, the transistor W over L ratio. This as a circuit designer. As a circuit designer, you can change that. So here we define this beta ratio as the W over L of the pull down transistor over the W over L of the pass gate transistor. You want this ratio to be large. You want this one to be large. That's a larger or equals than one. This is because if you want the resistance of PD1 large, oh, sorry, small, then you want the W over L of the PD1 larger. So there is a design consideration when you design the s run cell. The pull down transistor conductance will be higher than the pass gate. Or in other words, the drivability of the pull down transistor should be larger than the drivability of the pass gate transistor in terms of the current delivery ability. So if you look at the read operation, actually only those two transistors are active. All other transistors are off. Those transistors are all off. Nothing will happen on those transistors. For the read, you can only analyze those two transistors. That's enough for the read. And again, here, we have to make sure the zero does not increase too much. Okay. So let's look at the timing diagram here on the top right. So as we discussed, the bitline and bitline bar should be pre-charged to VDD. And then you turn on the wire line. So this pass gate be turned on, PG1. And then here, the bitline will decay because this read is current. And bitline bar will stay. So you develop this delta V for the sense amplifier to amplify. Meanwhile, if you look at the N2 and N1 node, sorry, I think there's a typo. So this should be N1, this is N2. So the N1 node will increase the voltage a little bit. At the same time, the N2 may decrease a little bit. Because this is cross-coupled latch, you think about the Butterfly curve, right? So here, if we increase N1 a little bit, the N2 will decrease a little bit. But as long as the increase of the N1 is minimal, the transistor, sorry, the, the, I mean the 
S1 will not be disturbed because after certain data V is developed, you will turn on the sense sample enable signal. Once the sense sample is enabled, then the S1 will read out, will be read out, and after that, you turn off the VLAN. Then the due to the positive feedback, then the N1 because the increase is minimal, then you will return to the original state. This is similar as we discussed earlier. So you think this is like a small disturbance, a small noise to the storage node. And then after the read operation, you can recover that. So any questions here? And no, because uh, uh, this is uh, very minimal, so the transistor is still off. So the N PG2 will not be turned on if the, for example, here N2 decreased a little bit, but the VGS, let's say this is G and S, right? VGS is still smaller than the threshold of the PG2, then bit bar will not decay. So that's why I said the N1, N2, the change should be minimal, like 100 millivolt or 200 millivolt. That means this is smaller than the threshold voltage of the uh, PG2, then nothing will happen on the right hand side. All right, so let's see any questions from the audience online. Okay, so then let's look at the rate of speed. So here the read speed is mostly determined by the passgate transistor current because here the bit plan BL and then the BL will have the state BL because the wires will have the capacitance. This is because between wires you will have the isolation. It's like a plate capacitor two wires, and in between you have the, the isolation, like a, a silicon nitride for the isolation. Then it's like a non wires, means non, means large caps. So between wires, you have those caps. So you can model the bitman cap with the lumped CBL. And then here the red current will flow this way. So to the first order, if you want to develop the voltage change on the bitman by delta V, that means bitman will change from VDD to VDD minus delta V. So if you want to ch change the bitman by delta V, then to the first order, you have this equation. Because the current through the PG transistor is Q5, the IPG times delta T, this is the rate speed. And then this is the total charge you get out from the bit line capacitance. And you know the charge can also be represented as the bit line capacitance times delta V. So it's always true this kind of equation. Current flow by some time equals to essence being discharged by a certain amount of voltage. So to the first order, you will have this equation. So this is uh, to create the delta V. Typically, for the sense amplifier to reliably sense output, you need like 100 to 200 millivolts. And then the delta T, this is like your s run rate speed. So you need to consider the bit time capacitance. And capacitance is a function of the distance of the bit line. So then the delta V, the delta T, you can get those. If you want to like a one nanosecond, you can back calculate what is needed for the current. So let me just put some reasonable numbers. If you want to read within one nanosecond, for a typical s run array, you want the current through the passgate transistor in the range of like 10 microns. 
to maybe 20 micron for a reasonable S run array result within one nanosecond, then you have to deliver the current about like 10 micron. This is to consider the baseline capacitance for 128 by 128 S run array. All right, I think time is up. Any questions before we end today's lecture? If no, then we will stop here today and uh, we'll see you on Wednesday.